Need you back up here. Open your Bibles, please. Uh, Psalm 27. As you do so, I'm very pleased to open my Bible after last week's <laughs> fiasco. <laughs> Psalm 27, we conclude today our uh, Summer in the Psalms uh, series. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we'll be back next summer, I think, back to the Psalms once again. Last week, as I was preaching on Psalm 34, I referenced Psalm 27 as a still more evidence of David's uh, resolve to worship the Lord. And in my little brain, uh, something said, you need to preach on Psalm 27. And so here we are today, and I trust it'll be a, a fitting conclusion to summer in the Psalms. Lord, thank you for great music. Uh, thank you that you've put a song in our hearts that uh, we, we sing now and we will sing to the end of the age and make melody uh, in our hearts to you. We thank you for the Psalms. We thank you for David, his love of worship, his love of you, and pray that your spirit will um, encourage us and uh, stimulate us to, to worship you and to serve you and uh, do so with great uh, joy and great enthusiasm. So to that end, we commit this time together for Christ's sake. Amen. We look at just the first six uh, verses here. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. For He will hide me in His shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of His tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in His tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. Amen. Well, at once uh, we're struck by uh, some of these same themes uh, as we read Psalm 27 uh, that we've seen in, uh, in uh, some of uh, David's other psalms. David was a man of uh, strength, of assurance, of uh, great confidence. I think specifically of Psalm 23 where uh, you know those familiar words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, he said. And I will not fear, he said. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Not a shred of, of, of doubt or um, hesitation or confusion in his mind. And here in Psalm 27, it's the same song, uh, next verse, essentially. The notice is his uh, strong confidence. Verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? These are rhetorical questions he's asking. He's saying he's not going to be afraid of anybody. For the simple reason that the Lord was his light, his salvation, his stronghold. Verse 3, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. I'm sorry, that was verse 2. The verse 3, though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, yet I will be confident. How confident would you be if an army encamped against you? Well, David had no fear, just an absolutely fearless individual. One of my favorite Proverbs is, is Proverbs 28, verse 1. The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The wicked are afraid of their own shadow. But the righteous are as bold and as confident 
as a lion, as, as the king of the jungle. Doesn't matter if an army encamps against me or war should arise against me, says David. My heart shall not fear, yet I will be confident. Martin Luther described God as a mighty fortress, as a bulwark never failing. And he admitted that there, there's, there are problems in life. Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. For God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Yes, the prince of darkness is grim, but we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall bring him down. One little word shall fell him. And David could have written the very same words himself. He knew God to be that mighty fortress and that bulwark never failing. And it didn't matter if Goliath threatened him or if Saul threw javelins at him or if Absalom led a rebellion against him or Shimei cursed him. It didn't even matter if his own men threatened to stone him as they did, if you remember that story, when the Amalekites took all their wives and children away and burned their village. Yet I will be confident. My heart shall not fear, said David. Now we know that uh, human beings tend to be overconfident at times. History is, history is littered with examples of uh, individuals and uh, sports teams that have been overconfident and suffered embarrassing upsets and uh, businesses that uh, think they know the way to go and, and uh, are overconfident and make tragic mistakes. Many of you remember New Year's Day 1962 when four young men traveled 10 hours uh, through a snowstorm part of the time to, uh, to audition. Fifteen songs they sang. But the recording label dismissed them and said groups of guitars are on their way out. And it wasn't long before the world knew those four young men as the Beatles. Bad mistake by Decca Records. <laughs> Kodak. Remember Kodak? 1975, 90% of all cameras that were sold in this country were Kodak cameras. That same year, they, they were the first company to invent uh, digital cameras. But they decided there really wasn't much of a future in digital cameras. <laughs> so they poured more money into film cameras, and by 2012, they declared bankruptcy. So we're tempted to say, David, don't be so sure of yourself. You know, show a little more uh, caution. Don't be, don't be overconfident. And that's the very point. He wasn't overconfident. He wasn't trusting in himself at all. His trust was in the mighty fortress. <laughs> His trust was in the, the one whose word is true and whose faithfulness is great, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, with whom there's no shadow of turning. To have a life worth living, we have to have a God worth trusting. David knew that God, as did the Apostle Paul. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded, I am convinced that he's able to keep that which I've entrusted to him against that day. David had great, strong confidence. Secondly, he had a singular concentration, a singular focus, if you prefer. Verse 4, one thing have I asked of the Lord. I love this verse, by the way. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You think David was a busy man? 
And we're talking about the king of Israel here. <laughs> of course, he was an extremely busy man. He had a nation to govern, a people to rule, decisions to make, a, a cabinet to work with. But all he really wanted, do you see that? All he really wanted in life was to be in the house of the Lord because that's where he saw the beauty of the Lord and the power and the glory. He didn't see the beauty of the Lord on the throne, wearing the crown, ruling over the nation. And so his burning desire, his singular passion was to be in the house of the Lord all the days of his life, to inquire in his temple, to experience that nearness to the Lord. To be in the house of God with the people of God was a a strength for him, a, 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 an encouragement. Nothing more he wanted in life. How about you? If you had to boil it down to one thing, if I put this question before you and left the answer blank, one thing I've asked of the Lord, blank, what would it be? David found strength and joy and peace and encouragement as he saw the beauty of the Lord and inquired in his temple. He didn't find that on the throne. He didn't find that with personal power. In another of his psalms, Psalm 63, David said, My soul thirsts for you. Just listen to the strong language. My soul thirsts for you. My soul faints for you to look upon you in the sanctuary and behold your power and glory. He didn't see God's power and God's glory on the throne, wearing the crown, ruling the nation. He saw it in the sanctuary. And by the way, when he wrote Psalm 63, he was running for his life. <laughs> he was being hunted by Saul. And yet it wasn't so much a desire to escape Saul and save his life as it was a desire simply to, to behold the power and the glory of the Lord in the sanctuary. His soul fainted to be there. And life was tough for him. He's running for his life. One thing I find is that so often when life is tough for us, when we're fighting battles, when we're discouraged, when we're fearful, we tend to leave the sanctuary. I don't know. I don't understand. Maybe the psychology is there's a sense of shame or maybe some anger at God. All I know is that <laughs> David wanted to make a beeline and he wanted to be there every day. I don't think he wanted to leave. It's like that's where he beheld the power and the glory and the, the beauty of the Lord. So back to my question. How would you fill in the blank? What do you want to do? More than anything else. One thing. Just one thing you could have. One thing that you really want, what would it be? To win the lottery? To get that job? Get married. Maybe you're already married. You want to fix your spouse? <laughs> Remember that story about the genie that appeared to the couple on their 25th wedding anniversary? They're having a nice dinner. They had a pretty good marriage. They're about 50 years old. And a genie appeared, and the genie said, One wish for both of you, individual. Make your wishes silently. It'll be granted. And so the wife closed her eyes and thought, and she wished to be on a, a yacht out in the Caribbean. Poof, all of a sudden, there they were on that yacht in the Caribbean. And uh, so it was a man's turn, so he closed his eyes, and he wished that he, his wife might be a good bit younger than, than he. And, and so, poof, all of a sudden, he was 90 years old. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> if David had had a genie, he'd have said, get me in the, get me in the sanctuary. Amen. It's only one thing I want. I want to see the beauty and the glory and the power 
of God. I want to be with the people of God. You can have the throne. You can have the crown. You can have the nation. He just wanted God. He just wanted to be in the, in the sanctuary. Strong confidence, singular concentration or singular focus. And finally, we see that David anticipated a spectacular celebration. Verse 6. And by the way, he'd already experienced some of this, but he knew the best was yet to be. Verse 6, now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Verse 2, I read earlier, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Those adversaries, those enemies, they're in for a rude awakening. Goliath may threaten. Goliath may intimidate. Goliath may insult. Goliath may curse. But all it took was one young boy or young man with one little slingshot and one small smooth stone and Goliath was no more and the Philistines were routed and there was a celebration like you've never seen all because that young boy or young man went against the giant in the strength of the Lord of hosts and when the Philistines were routed there were shouts of joy and they sang, and they danced, and they played tambourines, and they sung, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. So David knew what a spectacular celebration looked like. As did the people of God back, way back in the days of Exodus. When they crossed that Red Sea, boy, were they underdogs, just like David was an underdog. And there were the people of God trapped between the Red Sea and the most powerful army in the world. And all of a sudden, God blew a strong east wind. And you know the story. The people of God passed through, and the Egyptians tried to follow, and they were no more. And safely on the other side, a bedlam broke out. Pandemonium broke out. As they sang and danced and played tambourines again, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. Time and again, God delivers the underdog, and there's this tremendous celebration. Who would ever have thought that God would use a little fellow like Gideon the least in his clan, and his clan was the least of all the clans. But God used him because God uses the weak things to shame the strong, and the Midianites were routed. And don't you know there must have been a spectacular celebration. Likewise, when little, I shouldn't say little, but when lonely Mordecai refused to bow to Haman and and uh, his life was on the line, but God used Mordecai. And ruthless Haman was hung on his own gallows, and the Persian army was routed. There must have been a celebration unlike any other. And when Peter, he thread the story earlier, Peter's down to the last hours of his life, and he's chained, and he's guarded. But God. Amen! <laughs> God intervened again, and Peter was delivered and, and uh, able to preach, and he went to the house, and he knocked on the gate, and Rhoda was so excited she forgot to unlock the gate. Went and told the others, they said, you're out of your mind. That's what the world says about us. You, you enthusiastic people are out of your mind. Poor Peter's still out there knocking. <laughs> yes, God... This God we serve is an amazing God. 
and the most amazing thing is that he would use a man of sorrows, despised and rejected by men, acquainted with grief like one from whom men hide their faces, hanging on a tree to die for our sins and rise for our justification. And that's why we know that one day we will worship with shouts of joy and sing and make melody to the Lord. No whispers and no whimpers, just unbridled enthusiasm, spectacular celebration, shouts of joy. It'll drown out Henry McFadden. Well, last week I mentioned that uh, great football game seven years ago, Auburn and Georgia, and Auburn scored in the last few seconds of the game on a long pass, and uh, I decided to check the uh, YouTube uh, channel and see if there was a replay of it and listen to the announcer particularly the Auburn announcers, since they won the game. And I found it. And it's very interesting because the man started off with a tone of great resignation. All right, here we go. Fourth and 18 for the Tigers. Here's your ball game. Nick Marshall stands in, steps up, going to throw downfield, just a home run ball, and it's tipped up, and, and then a, there was a new man. <laughs> I mean, his volume went up about uh, a whole lot of decibels, <laughs> 50, 60, 70 decibels, and I can't, I can't reproduce it. I do confess I, I kind of got chill bumps listening to it again. It, this was seven years ago, but he says, he says, uh, um, Lewis caught the deflection. Lewis, Lewis is going to score. Lewis is going to score. Lewis is going to score. Touchdown, Auburn. Touchdown, Auburn. Sorry, Alabama fans. I know you hate hearing this story, but <laughs> <clears throat> it's a miracle at Jordan Hare. A miracle at Jordan Hare. 73 yards, and the Tigers are 25 seconds to go. Lead 43 to 38. Wow. Holy cow. My goodness. To quote Larry Munson, I think I just broke my chair. Karma has a way. Auburn has done it in unbelievable, remarkable, unlikely, incredible fashion. 43 to 38. War Eagle, everybody. <laughs> I won't talk about Auburn for a long time, I promise. <laughs> Alabama people. That's just a teeny tiny picture of the joy and excitement and exuberance, the bedlam, the pandemonium that you and I are going to have. Boy, do we have a future. Amen. We have got a future unlike any other, and we, we experience little foretastes of it now. But nothing like we'll have at the end of the age when we, we cross the, the Red Sea, as it were, or the Jordan River, and we're safely, safely on the other side. It's a miracle. Jesus Christ, everybody. And we will sing and make melody to the Lord with shouts of joy. And even the mountains and the hills will burst into singing and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Father, we look forward to that day. We pray that you will hasten it, bring it to pass soon, when we will shout joyfully and praise you for the miracle of salvation and the miracle of everlasting life that we have because you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. Hasten the day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To your glory, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.